Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is John Gorsny. I'm a uh, Head of L2 scaling at Quantstamp, so I'm interested in all things scaling. I apologize for the bait and switch. Um, there was some last minute change up for um, who's presenting and what was we were presenting um, in terms of Quantstamp here at, at this uh, conference. So I know you were promised discussions about flash loans, and my apologies. I'm not going to talk to you about that today. Um, instead, I'm going to talk to you about bridges, which is um, kind of nice because you saw one of the hacks actually in the last presentation, whether or not it was sort of addressed as one. Um, so my apologies if, for the bait and switch once again. So this is some work we've been particularly interested in. Um, a bunch of us here at Quantstep have worked on this, and you may have seen this at other uh, conferences, but uh, it's a talk that's going to go over a bunch of hacks that have happened um, in bridges. Bridges are our super critical component of, of most of our multi-chain ecosystem these days, and this you know talk is particularly relevant because they keep getting hacked. Um, there's a lot of money here at lost or possibly at risk or that was at risk for a lot of these bridge components. And so understanding what went wrong can help us prevent these things from going wrong again the second time, the third time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so obviously, yeah, lots of money in play here for these, these bridges and um, a lot of different ways to sort of um, exploit and, and attack them. And we're going to go over some of those in this talk. So first, we should all be on the same page as to what a bridge is. A bridge essentially is just a way to get assets, digital assets, typically cryptocurrencies or EC20 tokens, et cetera, et cetera, from one blockchain to another blockchain. Um, you know, you might have Bitcoin, you might want it on Ethereum so you can earn some nice DeFi yields on it, or you might want to take your whatever coin onto whatever rollup so that you don't pay as much in gas fees or, um, you know, any number of use cases. You can consider uh, bridging NFTs or, or even cross-chain calls and all sorts of things like this. And so essentially, we're going to be talking about the Ethereum ecosystem here because it's the most sort of familiar one, I think, for a lot of us. And it, it's the most general in the sense of, of good support for smart contracts that we've all talked about. And we're going to talk about bridging assets between Ethereum and some other chain. We're just going to call it another chain. We're focusing on the bridge and not the chain itself, so it doesn't particularly matter. How do bridges work? Well, they can't move an asset. Strictly speaking, right? Uh, an Ether on Ethereum is not the same as an Ether on, say, Arbitrum. They're going to be similar. They're going to behave similarly, uh, but they're not, strictly speaking, the same. Uh, Ether belongs on Ethereum, and so you might wrap it to bring it onto a rollup or onto another blockchain or wherever you want to put it, right? That might be a centralized exchange. might be somewhere. You're, you're bridging it somewhere. Um, and so how does this work? Well, bridges typically have three main components. They have a custody system, which is on Ether, which will take your, or, sorry, on Ethereum, which will take your Ether and lock it up. And then there'll be some communicator aspect, which is an off-chain protocol, typically, or, or piece of code that runs watching Ethereum, says, oh, look, someone put money in into this custo uh, custody smart contract. Let me make it somewhere else. And it's that sort of making of the second part that makes these um, additionally sort of susceptible to um, attacks and vulnerabilities. And what, what it does is it creates some representation of that asset, right? And so when I say Ether is not the same on Arbitrum as it is on Ethereum, technically speaking, that might be true. But, you know, the representation should be more or less the same or, you know, on any other rollup or any other system where you want to treat Ether as Ether. And so what we'll do is we'll have this communicator system watch the custody contract, which is also a nice target for a lot of people with a lot of bad intent because they can just you know, look at that and say, oh, there's a whole lot of Ether in there. Let me see if I can get it out. Um, then we'll see the, the communicator, which is an off-chain protocol because it needs to talk between two chains, which is something Ethereum currently cannot do. Uh, relay this message to the other chain and say, well, actually, someone over there locked up some Ether, so let's create some new version of Ether over here for this person on the other end. And you know, ideally, that is a standard that is well sort of accepted on that other chain. You don't want every bridge coming up with its own version of ETH, for example, because then trading ETH becomes an annoyance and there's arbitrage issues. And you know, technically, there's more contracts you may have to deal with, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but essentially, you have this, this process of I deposit somewhere, some system offline, off chain does something, and the other chain then gets a message from that off chain system and um, mints me some digital asset that is representative of the one I locked up. To withdraw from a bridge system, you sort of go the opposite, right? If you're taking money or ETH off of um, Arbitrum and you're trying to bring it back to, to Ethereum, you do the, the opposite process. You deposit in the custody on the um, the chain that you, you 
put your assets onto is the other chain, the roll-up, et cetera. Um, and you might not be locking it out because if it's an asset that's actually native to Ethereum, you might be burning it to sort of release it back into the wild on, on Ether. But essentially, the process is reversed. You do something on one chain, some off-chain system watches both chains, picks up the signal, and relays that signal. So that's what, what a bridge does in general. So more or less just trying to get things across so that we can use them in different situations for different use cases. And so the structure really boils down to, 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 to three things. Two sets of smart contracts, one on each chain, and this cross-chain component that relays messages between them because currently they can't natively do that, at least not on Ethereum. Maybe other chains support native cross-chain communication. Ethereum doesn't. And so as a result, you can attack every single one of these and it turns out most of the time, every single one of these has been attacked. Um, we're also going to talk about some specific cases like the network itself. Can you try to do something with Ethereum if there's time? I don't think we'll have time. Uh, and some, some things like the interfaces of specific things you're trying to transfer. So in particular, this interface actually covers the attack that was discussed in the last um, talk where the permit is just a fallback that doesn't revert because you can you know, trick the bridge into making that call for you and you steal all the funds as was sort of discussed. Okay, so that's, a, that's a mouthful. There's a lot. Let me try to slow down a little bit and let's go through at least one or two of them in great detail. I definitely have more than I have time to present, so if you have questions, please ask me. And similarly, if you wanted to hear about flash loans, but you're just that I'm not talking about it, please ask me at the end. All right, so what's the first one? Well, here we're going to try to attack the custodian. So this is the smart contract that lies on your layer one chain that you sort of initiate, initially had the assets on, um, so Ethereum in most cases. And we're going to say, how can we sort of get this to change? Um, well, one way to attack it is to look at a lot of these bridges and say, well, although the custodian is the key component in this bridge, usually what they will do to sort of modularize the system is say, well, I have a custodian responsible for taking funds and the interface for, for users and with other smart contracts for composability. But, you know, if I'm locking up funds, let's put that into a vault contract that's just beside my custodian contract. And this way, as long as the vault never does anything wrong, all of our funds are totally fine. And the vault will be managed by someone else. And so, you know, I don't have to worry about the security of the custodian necessarily as much because maybe the, the vault itself is responsible for this. And if something goes wrong, I can blame the vault operator. Um, the difficulty here is, well, what happens if something goes wrong with that, that vault operator, right? Can we change the vault operator? And so this is an attack that did actually happen. I'm not going to name names and say you know, who it was. Um, but at some point, this clever attack was pulled off. And so what happens is you have this custodian contract, um, which is the one that does the cross-chain calls, et cetera. And if you were to deposit something into it, you'd put that into a, a vault, and that vault would have a special admin, uh, an owner, a privileged address that is responsible for possibly managing that. Especially helpful if your bridge does stuff like invests in a DeFi wallet sitting around. I'm not sure that, that that's what's going on here, but you know, it, it's a plausible use case. And so one way you might want to try to trick this is to, 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 to trick the bridge into giving you rights for that privileged operator access uh, on that vault, which would be really bad, because then you can just do anything that you want on, on, on the vault. And so how can we actually do that? Well. We can maybe be clever if the bridge has is, is got some, some issues. And um, if the bridge is sufficiently advanced, you're also able to um, make cross-chain function or cross-chain function calls. Yeah. So I can call a function on Arbitrum with a transaction through Ethereum, maybe, on, on some particular bridge. I'm not sure that's the case. And I'm not saying this is an, an Arbitrum issue. Uh, but basically, any bridge from any one chain to the other can, can receive as input um, a function that I want to be called as soon as my assets are transferred to the other end. And so I get to specify whatever it is because I might be able to, say, immediately put it into a DeFi protocol. And I get to arbitrarily choose what this comes up, uh, this is, because it, it's necessary to be, call, to be able to call anything. And so what I can do then is I can be clever. Uh, what if the function I want to call is the function change privileged address? Uh, you know, in, in, in general, not an issue. Maybe I own some smart contract on the rollup that I'm using or the uh, other blockchain or whatever, and I want to change the privileged address. I'm allowed to do that. Um, cool. So I'm going to do this, and I encode this in, in standard Ethereum ways, which is to take a hash and to truncate most of it, just keep the first couple of bytes around, and it's going to call on some contract. I don't really care which one in this case, if I'm being malicious. Because what I'm actually going to try to do is now take this message, which will have been relayed onto my other chain, and now been signed by that chain's operator as a legitimate call, and then I'm just going to replay this on the layer one. 
So what happens is now I apply that sort of, oh, I, I, I saw this transaction occur on, on the other rollup, um, and it was done by the privileged operator of that rollup or of the layer one that's bridged to or whatever, and pass that information back to the custodian contract. And so now from the custodian contract point of view, someone who had the right permissions actually you know, signed off on the permission to give me privileged access to the vault. And boom, it's done. Um, so this was a little bit clever because A, you need to find a function that matches correctly to, to sort of handle some uh, specific cases. But because of how Ethereum encodes function calls, it wasn't particularly problematic and it could be done. And this did happen. Uh, another similar related attack is to sort of say, well, if people are signing off on cool things, can I modify those cool things in such a way that I can use them twice or three times or as many times as I want? And it turns out, yes, sometimes you can. There was another incident where someone came up with um, this whole process, you know, the bridge across and then bridge back by burning. And the burning happened with a proof of burn that in some cases on the source blockchain, so where the, where the custodian asset is, uh, some bytes of the proof are just not checked. And when bytes and proof aren't checked, you can fill in whatever you want and replay that message over and over again. So instead of making a single withdrawal, people were able to withdraw several times. Obviously a problem because one proof should be one withdrawal problem. Okay, so those are two, two attacks that actually happened um, on custodians. So this is the, the layer one sort of Ethereum end of things. But we can target these other issues as well. Uh, one way that might be feasible to do this is to say, well, I want to mint whatever I can on the other chain because if I can mint arbitrarily on my destination blockchain, then you know, as long as it's a legitimate minting, I can just legitimately transfer it back and there's no, no issues. So I'm just going to trick, trick the system into minting as much ether as I can on whatever system I'm talking about. And this has happened, unfortunately. It could happen. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that um, the debt issuer gets tricked. And so how are we going to do it this time? Well, here what we're going to do is we're going to look into the debt, debt issuer and say, well, how does a debt issuer actually work? Well, in some cases, maybe the verification logic for issuing some type of debt differs from other types of debt. So in particular, the logic to verify that I've locked up Ether might be different from the logic required to sign off on me depositing I don't know, Yon coin, whatever you want, right? Your own stuff. And if it's a decentralized bridge, you might be able to plug and play this any way you want. You might want to be able to say the bridge will support arbitrary ERC-20 tokens or whatever. So anyone can plug in these verifier systems. And so the debt issuer on the other side will be configured in such a way that when it wants to sign off um, or check that a message has been signed that, oh yeah, you can mint this, this debt wherever you are, um, you know, there might be a way to add those sort of publicly. And that may be a fe feature, not a bug. But if I put in a contract that's sort of clever, and again, there's a lot of details missing from this because I definitely cannot go through everything in, in 20 minutes for any one attack, let alone several. Um, if I put in a, a contract on the other end of that bridge that just says any signature is good, always mint stuff, well, I'm pretty happy because now if I can get the, the debt issuer to call my verification contract, which allows me to say anything is true, then cool, I'll just mint whatever I want. Um, and so that's exactly what happened in, in one situation here. And that's kind of clever. And for an example, because I am running out of time, and uh, yeah, I think what we can do for the last one is, is this the one I want to talk about? Yeah. The last one I want to talk about is attacking the communicator, which is sort of maybe the most straightforward in a lot of ways because it's not a smart contract. You sort of expect it to have issues that are more traditional of like a Web2 system. You might be able to attack it with pen testing flaws and things like this, right? It's not a smart contract. It might be a closed system that you don't have no actually in info on how it works because it's not a smart contract. But um, the key takeaway here is that a communicator, because it talks to different chains and reads from off-chain to write to the other chain, right? So if I'm bridging from Ethereum to, I don't know, Bitcoin, um, you know, it's got to read data from Ethereum that Bitcoin doesn't have, and essentially it's an oracle on that, that chain. And once things are oracles, we can start polluting oracles until we have better oracles. And certainly what you can do is you can pollute them with the minimal amount of effort in some cases um, because of how technically challenging it is to do some things on Ethereum. In particular, on Ethereum, it's really annoying um, from a technical point of view to read events emitted during transactions. Not saying it can't be done, but 
you know, it's it's non-trivial. There's not just a call that says read events, or at least at the time when this was going on, it certainly wasn't the case. And so to understand what events are admitted during a transaction, uh, say outside of Etherscan or in your own custom stuff, you had to do some math. People don't like doing math. And so what a surprise, people got it wrong. And so <laughs> what happens here is um, the communicator works by saying, oh, there's an event emitted on Ethereum, the Yon deposited Ether, Jan gets to mint Ether over there. Cool. What I can also do, though, is make my own smart contract um, that calls the smart contract, and it just emits that same event with the same name and the same address 20 more times. And the communicator will actually say, well, it has this event, and it's interacting with my smart contract, so it's got to be Jan depositing 21 times. And now I get to mint 21 times on the exit side of the chain, and then I bridge it back naturally, and I get all my money, which is kind of cool. This was a really clever attack, um, but yeah, it's a way to trick the stuff. Other things you can do if you are very malicious and clever, uh, you can attack the interface of the thing you're trying to bridge. Uh, we already saw this with the permit function on ERC-20s. So if you have a fallback that always fails, this can be definitely a, a problem. Um, these two slides are meant to talk to you about when you should revoke approvals, because every time a bridge hack goes on, the first thing you hear on, on Twitter is revoke approvals, and no one really tells you why. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, I'm not going to tell you why either. But if you ever see it, you definitely can. Uh, and, and it's because of attacks like this. The one that was th talked about the last slide saves me some time where the fallback just never fails, um, which is kind of nice. And um, I think that's, yeah, this one. So we can go over it again just very, very quickly. Uh, basically, what you do is you realize that if the function never fails and it's the bridge calling the function, it's actually the bridge doing the stealing. And so you can just sort of rely on the fact that the, the function never reverts and the user already approved the bridge to take those funds. And then the bridge takes the funds. Um, and even if you're not personally gaining, you're certainly shaking confidence in the entire system and the bridge. And you're doing a lot of damage to a lot of people. It's really kind of annoying. Um, other ERC-20 issues do exist, um, uh, but we don't have time to go into them. And if we had lots of time, we could also talk about the potentials of like problematic big picture attacks like, well, what happens if I bridge things and then my layer one has a reorg and what is the cost and penalties of actually doing that? The time this was written, it might have only taken about a million dollars to rent ether, or rent enough mining power in, in Ethereum to um, roll back and reorganize layer one. But if you had already done the bridge on the other end, of course, you know, maybe I'm bridging seven million that isn't supposed to be mine, and then I just roll it back, and now I have, you know, seven million minus one or whatever. Um, these are also possible. Thankfully, this one has not happened yet, and I'm hoping it never will. And um, there's some mitigations. In summary, a lot can go wrong. I'm running out of time. Uh, so a lot can go wrong. If you have any specific questions or you have a bridge concern, please talk to me or anyone at Quantsnap. And um, yeah, thank you.